Greetings. One of the best resources for you to learn about some of the countries in our world literature is to go to the CIA.gov World Factbook. These are all of the nations that make up the entire continent of Africa. I don't know if you know this, but I think even like three or four United States or North Americas could fit into that entire continent. I think there's something like 54, 50 plus nations for sure. Um, I've always had a dream of going to the place where my grandmother was. Uh, she lived for a couple of years. She lived in Sierra Leone, just outside of Freetown. She had to travel to Ghana uh, for a period of time to be treated for a disease that she had while she was there. My husband beat me. And elephants, by the way, are my favorite uh, animals. My, my great-grandmother gave my grandmother some elephants, and my grandmother always had fun trying to get me to say them and gave me lots of them over the years. And they've become kind of uh, representative of certain aspects and qualities and characteristics that I truly admire. They're very social creatures, and they depend a lot on each other. That's a side point here. Um, because of my interest in Africa, I've always wanted to go. I've read a lot of literature from there, some of my favorite literature in the whole wide world, um, including Chinua Achebe's Things Fall Apart. I've read some stuff from Lola Soyenka, um, lots of writings from authors from uh, South Africa. Um, one of my favorite series is Sitting Botswana. So I really enjoy learning a lot about it. Uh, I've had friends who've lived in Kenya. My husband got to spend a couple of weeks in Johannesburg. They call it Joburg. And also in Cape Town um, and beat me to it. Got to go on safaris, which is a lifelong dream of mine. I, I will be super happy if I get to go there. Um, there's so many countries in Africa that I really want to visit. Nigeria is the one where our story comes from today. We're going to be reading um, in the Shadow of War. Nigeria has a lot of oil in it, and the Shell Oil Company, which is a Western oil fuel company, went in and worked with the government, and that's not always worked out well for Nigerians on the ground. So um, it's been, uh, I've read some tragic stories and some amazing stories out of Nigeria. Um, and I've also had the opportunity to befriend people who are from that area. So it's um, it's very, well, uh, one of our teachers who used to be here was married to a Nigerian. And also um, one of my friends, well, no, she's not from Nigeria. A couple of other people I've met, though. So, um, and then my sister and her husband who live out in Washington, D.C. area have their son's best friend is from this country as well so just it's a very cool thing to learn about the different countries if you want to go there and learn about their society their government their economy their energy their transportation life has not always been good for nigerians and uh, that's important um, but at the same time it's a gorgeous area of the world and it's very diverse and complex and so one doesn't want to boil it down to one single narrative, as Chinomada Yichi Boshi says. So as we read, this is just one aspect of it. Um, there are groups of people who are oppressed, and Ben Oakley is writing a little bit about this. So he's a Nigerian writer who at 14 began writing poems, short stories, and essays, and by 18 finished his first novel called Flowers and Shadows. I've got a lot to live up to. With the manuscript in his suitcase, he went to London to study and work, and although sometimes penniless and homeless, he continued to write. The Famous Road, a novel about spirit children who were born over and over again, won the British Booker Prize in 1980. I should read that. As a teenager, Okri learned many tales from the oral traditions of his native culture. We were all told stories as kids in Nigeria, he said. We had to tell stories that would keep one another interested, and we weren't allowed to tell stories that everyone else knew. So you want to look at this story. We talk about plot, but really plot is about what happens when a person or persons want things that are different from each other. And as they rub up against each other in that particular situation, there can be complexity that makes it worse. When they rub against each other, um, they do something because of what they want and that upsets the equilibrium and we end up with conflict. And conflicts get more complicated oftentimes before they get better. Things get worse before they get better, right? <laughs> And then we have to look at how they end. So we can guess that whatever's happening here, it feels like war is about to, to descend upon these people. Let's find out more about what happens. I want you to be aware of what you do and don't know about the culture and about your own thoughts. Remember to listen to your reading, your inner voice. Um, ask questions. Try to figure out what you don't know 
And if you want, use the CIA World Factbook to learn more about the nation to better understand what might be informing this story. That afternoon, three stories. I'm sorry, start again. That afternoon, three soldiers came to the village. They scattered the goats and the children. They went to the palm prong bar and ordered a calabash of palm wine. That's a container made out of a gourd. They drank amidst the flies. Omogo watched them from the window as he waited for his father to go out. They both listened to the radio. His father had brought the old Grundig deeply from a fam- I'm sorry, cheaply from a family that had to escape the city when the war broke out. So it's a kind of German radio. He had covered the radio with a white cloth and made it look like a household fetish. They listened to the news of bombings and air raids in the interior of the country. His father combed his hair, parted it carefully, and slapped some of the aftershave on his unshaven face. Then he struggled into the shabby coat that he had long outgrown. Omogo stared out of the window, irritated with his father. At that hour, for the past seven days, a strange woman with a black veil over her head had been going past the house. She went up the village path, crossed the express road, and disappeared into the forest. Omogo waited for her to appear. That sounds to me like a bad omen, but we'll find out, right? A fetish is um, an object thought to have supernatural powers. It would have been like an amulet. So uh, something that you would hold on to and keep around your your neck or tuck into your clothing or something like that. The main news was over. The radio announcer said an eclipse of the moon was expected that night. Omova's father had wiped the sweat off his brow with his palm and said with some bitterness, as if an eclipse will stop this war. What is an eclipse? Omova asked. That's when the world goes dark and strange things happen. So there's a belief in a lot of cultures that it's not just the moon passing between the sun and the earth or the earth passing between the su- the, the moon and the sun uh, in this case that's what would happen so because the, the the moon just reflects the sun's light at us if this if the earth is in the way you're not going to see the moon it's going to get all dark and that would have been a bad omen in some in some cultures like what his father lit a cigarette the dead start to walk about and sing so don't stay out late eh omovo nodded Eclipses hit children. They ate them. Omovo didn't believe him. His father smiled, gave Omovo his ten kubo allowance, and said, Turn off the radio. It is bad for a child to listen to news of war. Omovo turned it off. His father poured a libation at the doorway and then prayed to his ancestors. So they would have poured out clean water or maybe like some of their palm wine. Um, it's a way of, of um, praying to those whose spirits who've gone before that have maybe interceded for them. When he had finished, he picked up his briefcase and strutted out briskly. Omovo watched him as he threaded his way up the path to the bus stop at the main road. When a Danfo bus came and his father went with it, Omovo turned the radio back on. He sat at the windowsill and waited for the woman. The last time he saw her, she had glided past with an agitated flutter of her yellow smock. The children stopped what they were doing and stared at her. They said that she had no shadow. Ooh, see, Omen, she might not be a real person. But they're all seeing her, so there's something going on there, right? They had said that her feet never touched the ground. As she went past, the children began to throw things at her. She didn't flinch, didn't quicker in her pace, and didn't look back. The heat was stupefying. Noises dimmed and lost their edges. The villagers stumbled about their various tasks as if they were sleepwalking. The three soldiers drank palm wine and played drops beneath the sun's oppressive glare. Amovo noticed that whenever children went past the bar, the soldiers called them. So Kobo is a unit of money and a libation, of course, like I said, it's a liquid poured out on the ground. A Danpo is like these dilapidated buses that people get on. There's some other words. In the Philippines, I think they call it a dilapi. My sister broke back some when she lived in the Philippines for a while. And Andrats is a British term for checkers, just so you know. So he talked to them and gave them some money. Omova ran down the stairs and slowly walked past the bar. The soldiers stared at him. On his way back, one of them called him. What's your name? He asked. Omova hesitated, smiled mischievously, and said, Eclipse. The soldier laughed, spraying Omova's face with spit. He had a face proud of the fiends. His companions seemed uninterested. They scraped flies and concentrated on their game. Their guns were on the table. Omova noticed that they had numbers on them. The man said, Did your father give you that name because you have big lips? His companions looked at Omova and laughed. Omova moved. You're a good boy, the man said. He paused, and then he asked in a different voice, have you seen the woman who covers her face with the black cloth? No, the man gave a mobo ten kobo and said, She is a spy. She helps our enemies. If you see her, come and tell us at once. You hear? A mobo refused the money and went back upstairs. He repositioned himself in the window sill. 
started to wonder if he went down thinking he wanted to get paid, but then when he realized he had to sell this woman out and he's curious about her, that maybe he turned it down? Or what do you think? I'm, this is what my brain is thinking. The soldiers occasionally looked at him. The heat got to him and soon he fell asleep in a sitting position. The cocks, that is male chickens, crowing dispiritedly woke him up. He could feel the afternoon softening into evening. The soldiers dozed in the bar. The hourly news came on. Amobo listened without comprehension to the day's casualties. The announcer succumbed to the stupor, yawned and apologized, and gave further details of the fighting. Amobo looked up and saw that the woman had already gone past. The men had left the bar. He saw them weaving between the eaves of the thatch houses, stumbling through the heat mists. The woman was further up the path. Amobo ran downstairs and followed the men. One of them had taken off his uniform top. The soldier behind had buttocks so big they had begun to spit his pants. Amovo followed them across the express road. When they got into the forest, the men stopped following the woman and took a different route. They seemed to know that they, what they were doing. Amovo hurried to keep the woman in view. He followed her through the dense vegetation. She wore faded wrappers and a gray shawl, and with a black veil covering her face, she had a red basket on her head. He had completely forgot to determine if she had a shadow or whether her feet touched the ground. He passed unfinished estates with their flaking, ostentatious sideboards. That would have been like very brightly painted and um, sides and fences. He passed an empty cement factory. Blocks lay crumbled in heaps and the workers' sheds were deserted. He passed a baobab tree under which was an intact skeleton of a large animal. A snake dropped from the branch and slithered through the undergrowth. In the distance, over the cliff edge, he heard loud music and people singing war slogans above the noise. I love how all of the scenery that he's describing is getting a little bit creepier and more broken as it goes and a little bit more like the snake dropping, a little more scary, but not too much so. Like we don't get the sense that he's scared. He followed the woman till they came to a rough camp on the plain below. Shadowy figures moved about in the half light of the cave. The women went to them. The figures surrounded her and touched her and led her into the cave. He heard their weary voices thanking her. When the woman reappeared, she was without the basket. Children with Kawashi her core stomachs and women wearing rags led her halfway up the hill. That means like the disease and malnutrition that causes like their stomachs to bloat. And you've probably seen some of that. So these are very sick people. Then reluctantly, touching her as if they might not see her again, they went back. He followed her until they came to a muddied river. She moved as if an invisible force were trying to blow her away. Omovo saw capsized canoes and trailing waterlogged clothes on the dark water. He saw floating items of sacrifice, loaves of bread and polythylene wrappings, gourds of food, Coca-Cola cans. When he looked at the canoes again, they had changed into the shapes of dead, swollen dead animals. He saw outdated currencies in the riverbank. He noticed the terrible smell in the air, and then he heard the sound of heavy breathing from behind him, and some coughing and spitting. He recognized the voice of one of the soldiers, urging the others to move faster. Omovo crouched in the shadow of a tree. The soldiers strode past not long afterwards, he heard a scream. The men had caught up with the woman. They crowded round her. Where are the others? shouted one of them. The woman was silent. You the switch. You want to die? Where are they? She stayed silent. Her head was bowed. One of the soldiers coughed and spat toward the river. Talk! Talk! He slapped at her. The fat soldier tore off her veil and threw it to the ground. She bent to pick it up and stopped in the attitude of kneeling her head, still bowed. Her head was bald, disfigured with a deep, corrugation. There was a livid gash along the side of her face. The bare-chested soldier pushed her. She fell on her face and lay still. The lights changed over the forest, and for the first time, Momova saw the dead animals in the river, who were in fact the corpses of grown men. Their bodies were tangled with river weed, and their eyes were bloated. Before he could react, he heard another scream. The woman was getting up with a veil in her hand. She turned to the fat soldier, drew herself to her fullest height, and spat in his face. Waving the veil in the air, she began to howl dementedly. The other two soldiers backed away. The fat soldier wiped his face and lifted the gun to the level of her stomach. The moment before Movo heard the shot, a violent beating of wings just above him scared him from his hiding place. He ran through the forest, screaming. The soldiers trampled after him. He ran through a mist which seemed to have risen from the rocks, as he ran, he saw an owl staring at him from a canopy of leaves. He tripped over the roots of a tree and blacked out when he hit his head on the ground. When he woke up, it was very dark. 
They waved his fingers in front of his face and saw nothing. Mistaking the darkness for blindness, he screamed, thrashed around, and ran into a door. When he recovered from the shock, he heard voices outside and the radio crackling on the on about the war. He found his way to the balcony, full of wonder that his sight had returned. But when he got there, he was surprised to find his father sitting on the sunken cane chair, drinking palm wine with the three soldiers. And Lovell rushed to his father and pointed frantically at the three men. You must thank them, his father said. They brought you back from the forest. Tom Lovell, overcome with delirium, began to tell his father what he had seen, but his father, smiling apologetically at the soldiers, picked up his son and carried him back to bed. So there's not a lot of emotion because he's a kid and kids don't have the, the level of emotions maybe that we have. They have a lot of curiosity, but they don't really have the kind of fear they need. And of course, the darkness could be mistaken for the moon and the eclipse but also like his name is very close to eclipse eclipse and so there's the sense that maybe um he uh does go blind or they knock him out and his father is kind of trying to protect him from the parts of the war that could affect them his father's being diplomatic trying to be in between the two things, like not fall on one side or the other before the soldiers went in there and not not involve his son. There's a lot of complexity when people get caught up in the war world uh, because you just want to live. You want to survive. And so we see some of this. So think about all those shadows and the blackness. And what about this woman? Is she? She's obviously not an actual witch. Um, she's probably trying. She's probably on the other side trying to help people survive. Um, there's a description in one of the books that changed my life. We wish to inform you that tomorrow we will be killed with our families about the Rwandan genocide. You've probably heard of Hotel Rwanda. Um, that was in 1994 when the Hutus went crazy. Um, they were incited and there was, um, their president was shot down probably by one of their own leaders to incite the war. There's a lot of theories on this. Um, and we know that they killed about um, almost a million people in three months or four months in, in that time period. And then a new um, president came and he just took the hero of Hotel Rwanda, Paulo Josefa Gina, and put him in jail. Because um, it turns out the new president, who was good for a while and rebuilt Rwanda, also was kind of a power monger. And that forces people to go between these two sides and never know where they're safe. Think about this. Think about our own country and our own civil war in, in April 1860s, to April 1865. Did we have people who wanted to control and hold power? Do we have people who just want power for themselves? What would it be like to live in that kind of world? I hope we never have to see that. What do you think? <laughs>